Welcome back, and we're joined again with Tim Alexander with Chris Harris. Chris, you've got some amazing reports to tell us uh, what's going on, what's happening. Well, we did discuss last week about whether uh, they actually pulled the two new fuel assemblies from the Fukushima Unit 4 spent fuel pool. Actually, actually, it's not a spent fuel pool. They're in, it's a, in their own, their own uh, storage area. Uh, so it wasn't really the, it wasn't indicative of what's going on in the spent fuel pool. That's where you store new fuel. But but they pulled out those two. And you asked me what what went on with the five weeks between then and now. Well, I, and today was released some pictures of it. There was some corrosion. There was some rust, as we uh, as we thought there would have been from the salt water. But most importantly, you know, they're saying there's no damage. They've inspected them. There's some good pictures in the article that I did send you. But uh, there are. Uh, embedded in it, and I don't really understand how they got how that got in there, but due to the explosion, there are chunks of concrete, like they're calling them two centimeter concretes, and for, for us, us uh, guys who use the English system, that's like a one inch chunk of concrete uh, peppered or embedded into the spent fuel of uh, actual, the, the rods that comprise the assembly. Well, you so, know the difference uh, between a detonation and a you know the difference between a detonation and a deflagration, right? Yeah. Detonation is over a thousand uh, foot per, uh, miles per hour, which means basically they had a nuclear explosion occur in reactor cooling pool four, which is like a shotgun aimed up with a nuclear explosion occurring right there, and that of course blew pieces of, of not only radioactive fuel rods but also the concrete there. They also had a, a detonation in reactor number two because they know that the reactor core was broken. Uh, there was a detonation there, so there's concrete chunks flying everywhere and radioactive uh, fuel rods. Uh, flying everywhere, including in f- cooling pool number three. The, uh, that one, the detonator went straight up. There were chunks of plutonium MOX fuel reactor pellets that went flying everywhere up to maybe 50 kilometers away. Uh, guys, when you say detonation, you're not talking about... Uh, well, 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 explain to a poor dummy like me exactly... Well, a detonation what, is just a faster... Is it hydrogen gas or is it... Uh, uh, no, if you have a hydrogen explosion, it's probably a deflagration where you get a, basically an explosion, but it's below a thousand miles per hour. When it's a detonation, it means it's a high explosive like RDX or a nuclear explosion or something that's real high, like a, like VX, like a, one of these you know plastic uh, kind of explosives. Okay, but, but uh, what's what's there to explode? When you say nuclear, I mean you're not. Well, you had a hydrogen triggered nuclear explosion, is what happened. That's what they think happened. When Arnie Gunderson talked about that in some of his video clips, if you go to uh, to, to Fairwinds, you can actually see that. So, it uh, must be, but it must be fairly low because the the, the oh yeah, you can have low yield. There. You can have the, these tunable ones that I was told when I was uh, taking care of people working uh, in the Oklahoma City Mer building. The uh, the guys told me one of the guys told me that they had tunable or adjustable micronukes the size of a large softball that could be tuned down to a hundredth of a kiloton, uh, right up to uh, fifteen to uh, to a hundred kilotons, and these were adjustable, so uh, they could have small ones that were used for for uh, explosives. So you could actually have a tunable uh, micro nuke that was using these advanced uh, technologies for explosion uh, that were giving amazing amounts of yield. That was very adjustable. Yeah, I, 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 I they I, they adjust them by by uh, lowering or raising uh, the. Uh, uh, the weapons grade material in uh, yeah. the um, I guess it's a spear but I don't see how they do that but anyway yeah. uh, whatever it is that they're going to to detonate it if it's a, if it's well, not, not a spear they, it's a pancake they, that they're well, they told me they weren't using they weren't using the typical type of explosives like plastic that would explode the core and compress it they're using what's called high speed crytron switch Supercapacitors. So it was basically a supercapacitor uh, type of detonation. Which is a standard detonation. implosion, implosion thermonuclear device, basically. Yeah, exactly, and that's why they can miniaturize them. Uh, we need to talk about some other issue here that uh, Chris brought up that I thought was really shocking, and it was the whole idea of cyber warfare and the SCADA, which are the uh, control systems for the for the power, uh, if you want to call it the power switch yards, outside all these nuclear reactors. And it turns out the IP address uh, that showed up. I want you to tell the whole story uh, was not American. Uh, can you fill in the details, uh, Chris? Tell us all about that. Yeah, well, you know, this uh, this fellow is a um, 
about uh, he wrote the article. Oh my goodness, uh, what was his name again? Um, uh, hold on one second. Let me just grab this. Yeah, I have the anyway, article. It'll be posted over so people actually can read it themselves. It was actually from okay, controldesign.com. All right, that, that's, that's, that's good. Yeah, I, um, to, to make a long story short, he is a programmer in the field of SCADA. Now, you know, we've been, we've been harping on what SCADA is for a while now because this year alone there have been at least several unexplained loss of power at several power plants this year. And you know, I just threw out the conjecture saying, you know, if anybody's got control of the grid through the SCADA network, then you can you could just you can't really get inside of a plant. You can't start twiddling with all the controls in there, but you can take away the electrical power. Right. In other words, you can cause a station blackout, and the hot shot down here at San Onofre probably is one of the major reasons why that entire new. Uh, steam turbine generators were put in the last two years by Hitachi Corporation why they broke down because the hot shutdown already blew this design fault uh, turbines to pieces which is why you know literally thousands of these steam turbine tubes blew up and it means the SCADA they turned out what, what, what you show what plant was it that showed this but they actually had a Russian IP address that was actually found linked to the SCADA failure at this plant which plant was it well, this was, this this particular plant was a uh, a water treatment plant, right? A pumping station that was shown to have um, uh, control by remote control via a Russian uh, a Russian IP address. But here's the here's the problem though: SCADA is used in the grid, sewage treatment plants, water treatment plants, any other major grid you can think of. And I just wanted to just kind of reiterate in here that. If you've got, it's also called a PLC or a program yeah, PLC or forward slash SCADA. Yeah, so people can search right. that PLC forward slash SCADA, S C A D A, and what that right. means is so that they can hack into it from China, from the Blue Army. There, they actually have an Iranian cyber warfare army, Syrian cyber warfare, and this is Russian. The Russians are very good at mathematics. They can hack in. And one of the first attacks you may have is that your sewage treatment plant's down. Also, you have a station blackout to nuclear plants that they don't have proper backup power beyond four to eight hours. Not good. That's, may I ask an yeah, obvious that's question? We, we've known that, that, that we're at risk here because of this kind of stuff for years. Why in the heck is all this stuff still on the Internet? I don't understand why we don't have system to block IP addresses from other countries, or we can't verify that or certain IP addresses uh, are allowed. It, to me, it's, why isn't there some kind of a buffer to say, well, no, you can't hack onto the darn Internet or to get onto SCADA well, or the can, power grid? Well, they can that. Why, why should a, uh, uh, access to a control grid uh, be through the Internet? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, you know, Tim, uh, Dr. Bill and I had this conversation before we went on the air. You know, we we're pretty much threw our hands up in the air. Either, either they allow it to happen, they want it to happen, or they don't know what to do about it. You know? Well, uh, why don't they have a separate fiber optic system which is completely separate from the Internet for all the grid? And I personally yeah. believe in what I call a decentralized grid, where you have a background grid, but you have what I call a microgrid. In other words, you have a territorially, um, let's say, Liquid propane, liquid natural gas or propane micro generators that can cover a territory. If the grid starts to go or starts to get wonky, they'll just kick on and disconnect from the major grid. So it doesn't spread like a cancer. What happens is, and what happened in Yuma, Arizona last year, September 8th, is somebody hit a few keystrokes in Yuma, Arizona because they had a transient surge on the grid of the power coming out of a nuclear reactor. What they did then is they hit a few keystrokes and that literally caused a power wave that started shutting down breakers all the way through and by the time it got to San Onofre they had a hot shutdown which actually destroyed their equipment not good and my radiation detector went up for four days so that's what I call not an on purpose not a stupid not an accident that's a stupid design flaw and they need to smarten up real quick and they lost no a lot care. of money Southern California Edison and uh, these idiots now they aren't going to be able to uh, get the plants back up because they blew it Welcome back, and uh, so let's continue this report. Um, when we look at all of the news that's going on, we have the impending attack 
which, you know, honestly, they need to secure the weapons. But one of the best ways to do it is to come clean with the Bashir Assad, to also uh, have an international force to make sure that the, there is no movement toward having an Islamic bomb in, in uh, Tehran, and also to stabilize the weapons in Pakistan. But people don't understand that if we attack Iran, Pakistan's already said it's going to be an ally of Iran. We need to also realize that a preemptive attack on Syria, they will use the weapons against us and against Israel. Israel will then go to the, uh, the Samson option. What I think needs to happen is something that's probably not going to happen, is some rationality to say, let's control and stabilize these weapons of these disparate forces at each other's throats. And we're very likely to be seeing, if there is a regional war, an attack on the Bashir reactor that's fully fueled with hundreds of Russian scientists and technicians. This uh, situation is very nuts, and I, I think it's very probable that, that if the things deteriorate in the Middle East, it may not, and it happens before the election, there won't be one. Um, and I think, of course, the Jewish in Japan won't be because it could be so chaotic here. Uh, and I can't get a straight so answer. For, by the way, I sent my, I did an article uh, that I'm going to be published in the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. I sent a copy this morning to. Um, to have a, a quick look at it that's going to be published by the Academy. I sent a copy also to Senator Feinstein and Senator Wyden's office, and I don't know what kind of response, but they don't understand that the Fukushima Daiichi is the biggest environmental disaster in human history. And I'm not exaggerating on that. This is hundreds of times worse than Chernobyl. This is far worse than even the the Macondo uh, disaster in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a different kind of disaster. And by the way, that disaster is not over. They're still using Corexit. They still have seeping oil in the bottom of the Gulf. It's still affecting global weather patterns and killing not, people all over the world. Not only that, I have a feeling that the subsidence down in, that's occurring along the Gulf Coast where those giant uh, sinkholes are occurring uh, and the uh, tremors that are occurring along the New Madrid fault system are directly connected to the Macondo area. So I think there's some geological connections there. And we're going to start seeing some earth changes that are going to really... Uh, not make our day, let's put it that way, in the next couple of years. I'm not being negative. I tell people if you're proactive and you plan for certain kinds of disasters, you can adapt to them and you can survive them. But if you assume everything's going to be a sunny day and everything's perfectly and it's not a nice day, it's not smooth sailing. <laughs> and if you're ready for a non smooth sailing day, it may be, you may what be you're saying, saying is it's fun, it's nice to go sailing, but take your life preserver just in case. Exactly, yeah. So. Chris, what do you, you think is happening in Fukushima? I'm looking at my radiation detector, and it's doing funky things. I'm seeing it, and it does really short, snappy surges. It'll go up to, like, 70, and then it'll drop to, like, 45, 50. I'm thinking, what? It's shooting up again, but it doesn't last long. And this kind of tells me, uh, I got a report that, that a few days ago, that they had the 61st major, we call, release. This is a term they use in Japan. Can you kind of highlight what a release is? Because they're releasing millions of tons of highly radioactive water with billions of becquerels of radiation uh, into the ocean and they're releasing it into the air and nobody's even talking about the fact that we're not getting data I've been repeatedly asking these senators offices including the expert there at uh, Senator Feinstein's office and by the way Senator Wyden's office in Oregon if you're living in Oregon you need to contact Senator Wyden they're not responding to my calls or emails. Nothing. Not even a, please don't call back. Nothing. Uh, I'm amazed. I mean, these people are remarkable, and I want, I want answers. And it's going to be published in the Academy. Um, I was going to do a presentation this coming October, but that paper is available for people to have a look at with references. And it's not the, first, the final paper either. It's going to be many papers written on this issue because a disaster is going to cause birth defects, every illness you can imagine, destruction of food supplies where the food is going to get increasingly radioactive. And when you interact it with all the other biotoxins in the environment and the danger of a possible regional nuclear war in the Middle East, and it will be nuclear. This will go nuclear very fast, and it will also go biological very fast. Well, okay, yeah, that's a good question, Gary. You know, and a release really pertains to the water is accumulating inside these plants for several reasons. First of all, the, the, there's a leak, leaks in the reactors and leaks in the containment building, and they got to keep adding water to keep the thing cool. That's one source of water that goes in clean, cleaner, and comes out really contaminated. Also, groundwater gets leaked into the plant, um, and also rainwater. So. Well, remember, we talked a long time ago, you've got to stop the influx of, of, of clean water. This is just basic contamination control, because it's all going to come out radioactive. So now they have 
uh, the makeshift system that we talked about, they're going to use the filtration system so they can at least recycle some of the water. But some of the water, really what you're ending up doing is you're making the, um, the product, really, from the filtration plant is something called sludge. And this sludge is, uh, well, we, we talked about it last time. There was thousands of gallons of, this has got it, this is the most radioactive stuff around. It's got chunks of fuel in it and everything else, everything you don't want, mostly cesium at this point, from what I've read. Uh, they got to store this on site. Now, the release part of it is anything that, that's clean enough to release because there's no room in the tanks anymore. They're ordering new, new tanks. And we said that if you're going to have a, um, if you're going to keep on using this, uh, this technology where you filter out the existing uh, radionuclides and pump in fairly clean water again, you still have that, you're still going to get waste. Well, you got to convert it to a solid waste so they can transport safely in double hulled ships to a final depot on the bottom of a zinc mine or some other place in a giant, giant trench deep in the ocean. They've got to do something that makes a lot more sense so the stuff is stabilized for billions of years. But I don't see any international consortium. I don't see the U.S. government involved. Obama's prancing around, uh, acting like, well, it's important to get me reelected. Who cares about Japan? And uh, it lacks any common sense whatsoever. I mean, we have a Hollywood, you know, love fest of, you know, if you just worship Obama, he'll give him more change and everything will be fine. And nobody in the government is doing anything. The Environmental Protection Agency, RADnet isn't being operated properly. We have no analysis of food, water, or anything. And we don't have American experts reporting in the regular snooze media anything about what they're going to do to prevent radiation from coming to America or, as I mentioned before, radiation plume detection using detectors. Uh, you can go to our website, affiliate, Less EMF. You can get a, a little detection USB port, hook it up to your laptop or your it'll, iMac or whatever, uh, or, or even your Kindle, and then just directly connect it to your, uh, to your radiation detector, you know, like your Inspector Plus or Inspector EXP. You can have a continuous record throughout your entire flight, and you can even press periodically to get the GPS coordinates because your cell phone will tell you your GPS coordinates or your iPad, and you can take a photograph of it and know exactly where at different altitudes and different places along your flight paths what the radiation is. But the government's going to do nothing. And if they do know anything, they're not going to tell us because they don't want us to know that we're all dying from radiation poisoning. They don't want to tell you. And, of course, your body's going to replace damaged cells if you're taking the right Nutrimeds, if you're drinking clean filtered water and taking care of yourself. But if you're marginal, if you're, pre if you're a, a baby in utero, if you're an elderly person, if you have a serious health problem, it's going to kill you. And it's going to hurt and make you sick first before it does that. Uh, just uh, that's just like a side note. You're talking about uh, White House doing something or whatever. Remember, David Axelrod, this came out in the New York Times uh, last week, uh, the 23rd, August 23rd, which I did send you uh, a copy of this. It shows how David Axelrod, which is uh, one of Obama's right-hand guys, uh, was on the board of director of Exelon and, and obtained favors in the form of lots of money. And, yeah, in other words, they're, they're, they consider nuclear, they consider improperly run nuclear power as green. Well, nuclear power is going to be run properly. It needs to unveil hidden technology like tokamak fusion reactors, safe nuclear reactors where there's no on-site radioactive material storage, conversion technology to solid nuclear waste that can remove it on-site, no release of tritium from nuclear reactors to surrounding communities, but we don't have any of that. They don't have any endpoints talking about this or the idea that the real... Are you guys saying that our danger. politicians aren't taking care of us? I can't believe that. Well, they are. They're actually, they're, <laughs> they're actually cosmeticians for the more... Uh, you know what we should do is we should change, change their terms from being politicians to being cosmeticians. Because they're actually... That's what I mean. They're, they're cosmeticians for the, more, the, more, the mortician, for the mortician's office. So what they want to do is kind of plump up our cheeks, increase our collar, make us look good while we're dead. We'll never look better. <laughs> you make a really good looking carp, sir. <laughs> yeah. It's like all the people of America, you know, you look man, those Americans look good. Look at all the Olympics we won. But our population is getting more radioactive every year and we did nothing for the last year and a half over Fukushima. And the jobs are all gone and the terror uh, the fascism is growing and uh will be and we're headed towards WW three. We, we can fix that in six months with repentance, with action, and with a little bit of honesty, which we don't have. I call this new statement yeah, turning to God. That's the first step. It's the most important step. Absolutely. And uh, the timeline is moving on. 
We're heading into the fall shortly, and as Labor Day is coming, getting closer and closer to the end of 2012, and it's going to be different than what people expect. It won't be the end of the world, but it's going to be a hell of a pre-show, let's put it that way. <laughs> God bless. Back tomorrow with Firing Line and much more, and preparedness, you don't want to miss a report from John Moore. Take care, everybody, and take action.